two of our Relationship Goals series at Avenue. And we love this, this series because all of us have a next step. So whether we're married, we're dating, we're single, it's complicated, divorced, widowed, it doesn't matter, like all of it, we have a next step. And we are all about next steps at church. Uh, To all of our first time guests, we welcome you. Uh, We're so glad that you're here with us today. It's a great Sunday to be at church. We gave you a connect card, that's a next step. Growth track is a next step because we all have a step to take. Now think about steps in relationships, right? If you are single, where are my single people at? Make some noise. Woo, come on, make some noise. Yes, single. When you are single, what do people ask you? When are you going to start dating? Now, when you are dating, what is a question that you always get? When are you going to get what? Married. Married. Tell my married people at. When you get married, they ask, when are you going to have? That's right, that's right. And then when you have one child, they go ahead and turn around and ask you again. When are you going to have another child? See, we need to get worried when people stop asking us questions. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But there's always a next step. See here, I'm, I love next steps because I'm, I love dreaming. I love dreaming. I love planning for the future. But I see a problem where it comes to being so future focused. Because if we're all about what's going to happen next, come on, we're missing what's happening now. If we're all about, okay, God, what do you have for me in the future? What's to come, God? God is like, you're missing what's happening right now. I have plans for you now. There's things in my purpose and in my purposeful plan for you that are going to take place now. And I need you to not just look out to the future, but I need you to look around what's happening now. See, I don't know about you, but I mean, I've been waiting on a promise from God for over 10 years. And that doesn't mean that my life hit the pause button and I can't hit the fast forward button, I still have to live now. So I believe that God, God wants to do things now. Your life matters right now. The season, come on, that you are in, it matters right now. So let's pray real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you so much. And I'm asking that you would do what only you can do. Father, our hearts are open, our minds are open. Open up our ears. God, change things in our lives. Make us more like you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Seasons, right? We know that word. If you've been in church for any length of time, you have probably heard the term season. And we use it to describe things that we're going through. Weather has seasons. Come on, we're stepping into spring. I'm really excited about that. It's warming up out there. We've got spring. We've got summer. We've got fall. We've got winter. But guess what? Life has seasons too. There's so many seasons represented in this room. You're walking through something that I'm not walking through right now. Your season is different than the person sitting a couple chairs down from you. We all represent something in this room, and whether you are walking into something, some of you are like, thank you, Jesus, I'm walking out of a season. Others, you're about to just walk through something, but there are seasons all over this room. Do you know that seasons can make us stronger, or seasons can break us? Seasons can actually bring out the best in us, or seasons can get the best of us. Seasons can strengthen. They can show what's your relationship. We have been through some hardships over the years, and things have brought us closer together. But come on, how many of y'all know there are some seasons that actually bring the opportunity for couples to be torn apart? They're seasons. And so when we find ourselves facing difficulties or insecurities, frustrations, hardships or loss, our relationships suffer or they even tank, we want to blame the season. Well, if I wouldn't have lost my job, then this wouldn't have happened. Or if I wasn't so busy with school, these relationships wouldn't have suffered. Or if I hadn't been so, so stressed out at work, I wouldn't be so distracted or distant at home. And we, we want to blame the season. But I want to tell you that, that seasons, we don't have control of them, do we? We can't look and predict the seasons, but we have to know that our God knows the seasons that we're going to walk through. Seasons may be unpredictable to us, but they're not unpredictable to God. And the God that we serve is with us in and out of season. The God that we serve walks with us right next to us. We're not without him as we're walking through some storms in life. So maybe you didn't see some clouds on the horizon coming your way and you felt like you were a little bit blindsided by a season. God was not blindsided by it. And I want to tell you that God desires for you to be secure in your season. Will you say season? God wants us to be secure in my season. 
Again, they're unpredictable, but seasons can make us better. We can be secure in them. And what, what do I mean by secure? Well, when I think about seasons, I think about two people, really. Two people automatically come to my mind in the Bible when we talk about seasons, because seasons can be crazy. Some of you, you got a season in the rearview mirror, and you're like, thank the Lord it's in the rearview mirror, because seasons are tough. But I do, my mind automatically goes to these two people. And I'm an OT girl, I've already warned you several times, I love the Old Testament. So my people that come to my mind are Joseph and David. And see, both of these people, at a very young age, were given a picture of what they were gonna be. At a young age, you're talking adolescent, they were told that they were gonna have great leadership and great authority and influence in the future. And yet seasons came their way. And seasons, when I say that God wants us to be secure in our season, it means that God wants us to be firm in the season that we're in. Some seasons leaves bumps, some seasons leave some bruises, but there is a way that we could be secure and get our feet planted so that I can endure the season that's coming at me. God wants me to be secure in my season. And so if I look at these two guys, let's talk about Joseph. Where am I, all, where are my single people, you guys? Yes, because hear me, Joseph was single for a lot, a lot of years. And this man went through some stuff when he was single. He had a calling of great authority. The Lord gave him two dreams to show him what he was going to do in his future. And Joseph, in these two dreams, he saw his brothers and those around him representing that they were bowing down to him, and that he was the one in leadership. Now, you got to understand, he was number 11 out of 12 children. Like, he was not in the pecking order to be the person to say, I'm number one, and I'm going to have authority. And so he went to his 10 older brothers, and he told them, guess what, guys? One day you're going to bow down to me, my husband. When we are driving down the street, he will hit the brakes, and he will go bow down to me. And everybody goes flying forward in whatever car you're riding in with Jeremy. So basically, Joseph tells this story. That guys, guess what? This, this is what's going to happen. And Joseph's brothers get upset because they already knew that the dad favored Joseph. He loved him. So now we already are dealing with comparison issues in relationships. The favorite child just told me he's going to rule over me one day. So the brothers plotted to kill him. Now there was one brother named Reuben who said, you know what? Let's not kill him. Because hear me, Reuben had a gut check. No, 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 no. We're not going to kill him. Let's throw him in a pit and leave him there and he'll die. What Reuben didn't tell his brothers is that he planned to go get Joseph later, rescue him and take him back to his father. But I got to tell you, if you know the story, you know that Reuben missed his chance. Can I stop for just a second and say too many of us are missing chances to stand up for what's right? Too many of us are finding ourselves in conversations or situations where you have a gut check and your gut check is screaming, no, don't let this happen. Don't participate in this. This is wrong. And Reuben had a gut check, but instead of standing up, he stood back. And he said, I'm going to silently deal with this later. But when he came back, we know the story. A caravan had passed by, and his brother saw the opportunity. Okay, well, let's not kill Jojo. Let's sell Jojo into slavery. And they sold Joseph as a slave to this caravan. And we find in our story that Joseph ends up in Egypt. But in this is so amazing because the Lord was with Joseph in Egypt. See, some of you are walking through seasons, you're like, why in God's name would he give me this season? Well, we could say the same thing about Joseph's life, can't we? Yeah. Why in the world, if God loved him and called him to this great future, why would he make him go through these situations? Why on earth would he be sold into slavery? Well, the Bible tells us that when Joseph arrived at Potiphar's house, at Potiphar's house that Potiphar saw that the Lord God was with Joseph. And that anything that Joseph put his hands to, he succeeded it. Hear me, friends. God is with you in your season. God is with you, and you can have success in your season. Do you know, friends, you can be successful and single. You can be single and successful. I think some of us were too busy wanting God to remove us out of our season to move us on to the next season, and we're missing what's available right here and now. We're missing the opportunities. Joseph was single and successful. Can I talk to the singles for a minute in the room? Because hear me, in America right now, in our U.S. history, we have the highest rate of single Americans. 45% of Americans are single. Men are waiting to age 30 to get married. So the lady's like, oh, that explains it all. <laughs> Do you know that ladies are waiting until 28 years old to be married? 
See, that wasn't the story back in the day when, when I was dating. People were getting married young. I think it's just because, honestly, we wanted to keep our pants on and not get in trouble. And so people were just getting married to solve the purity problem. But that's not the case now. People are waiting until 28 to 30. We're back in my day. If you weren't married at 22, something was wrong with you. And you're asking and begging God, what's wrong with me? Where's my husband? Where's the man of God? And we're in a different, we're in a different time now. But instead of having our frustrations in our singleness, we need to start recognizing the freedom that we have available to us in our singleness. Can I tell you some insight? Your money is your money if you're single. How awesome is that? Your bank account has your name on it. Your credit card has your name on it and you're not sharing with anybody. So you tithe and you save and you spend and guess what? You don't answer to anybody but you. Where are my married people at? We got to ask each other for big, big expenses, right? We got to ask each other before we spend some big money on some big purchases. I remember when I married into Jeremy's family, there was a story of his father. Now, friends, this was before cell phones, so this wasn't too long ago, but long ago. You know what I mean? And Jeremy's family, they owned a lake cam- cabin in Minnesota. And so they got to the lake cabin with all the kids and realized that we don't have bread. I can only imagine the fights that that started, like who forgot the dang bread, right? And so you already got this bickering going on. And dad says, I'll go buy bread. Four hours later, he came back with no bread but a boat. He bought a boat, right? I cannot even imagine. I'm like, somebody is buried on this this lake lot right now because somebody would have died if that would have happened. But he did. He went and bought a boat. Single people, you can buy a boat. And you don't have to answer to anybody. How awesome is that? Your money is your money. Do you know that your time is your time? When you're single, you got a lot more time than you think you do. And I laugh because our single people, they often say, I'm so tired. You get, you're working, you're going to school, you're exhausted. But guess what? When you're married and have a family, you're going to be even more tired. You're going to come home from your 9 to 5 job, and you've already given 100% to your customers, to your boss, to your teammates, to your coworkers. And now your family wants 110% of you. You thought you were tired before. You're exhausted now, but you got to show up and you got to keep showing up. And so use what you may see as a frustration. Use what you may see as, as, as this pause button in your life. It's not a pause button. It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to build your future. Do you know that we have a missions trip coming up to Panama? We are going to Pam- Panama on June 13th through the 19th. I'm telling you, it's going to be awesome. We're going to go make a difference. There should be so many singles on that trip. Hear me, it's going to be a sacrifice because it's going to cost something. It's going to cost your time. But for a single person, you don't have to arrange for the children all to be taken care of and the husband to be taken care of. You don't have to do that. For, for the person who is not tied down, and I'm not just talking single with children. I'm talking you're just single, uno, by yourself. Okay, the single parent has a lot of struggles and a lot of sacrifices. But I'm talking to the person who's not married with no children. You just get to make arrangements for you. And I would love to see this Panama trip filled up with some single people. I think it's going to be amazing what we're going to do. Use this time not to be frustrated looking forward. Use this time to define your standards. Use this time to define your values. What matters to you? Define your standards now so you don't have to defend them later. See, I did three incredibly important things in my single years. I gave my life to Jesus fresh out of high school at 18 years old. And then I got married at 23 years old. And I did three things that were game changers in my single life. Number one, I had a journal. This journal is actually one of four journals. I wrote a lot when I was single. Some of y'all haven't even written three sentences in 10 years. But I'm telling you, to be able to put my thoughts on paper, this is what keeps my my eyes on Jesus. This is what kept me focused. To be able to keep fighting the good fight, to be able to, to, to hang on in there in my seasons of frustration, my seasons of loneliness, I journaled. Number two, I made a list, and we'll we'll get to that later on in this series. But start making a list of what you want in a future spouse. What do you want for your life? Now, if you're married, don't you dare make a list. That's wrong. Like, you, you have what you have. You work with it, girl or man. All right? You work it. But if you're not married yet, what are your no compromises? What are boundaries that you're not willing to cross over? What are the non-negotiables that you are looking for in a future spouse? Because the thing is, is that we don't, we don't want to be alone, but we don't know what we're looking for. 
We don't want to be single, but we, we, we haven't really thought of the criteria in which I'm believing for to be my spouse. So number one, journal. Number two, make a list. Number three, surround yourself with friends that share the same vision and values as you. See, this is my journal from September 9th, 2006. This is 13 and a half years old, and I was single. And I wrote that day that I was struggling. I had just gotten broken up, and it was just a bad deal, and I was sad and all that weepy stuff. And I wrote this in my prayer journal. It said, yesterday, my friend Jason Townsend, you got to have friends. But my friend Jason Townsend, he prayed over me. He said this, the man that you will marry has to search out the heart of God to find you because it is in the heart of God that your heart is hidden. See, we got to have friends around us that are going to speak life into us. We have to have friends around us that aren't going to encourage us to compromise or hit the fast forward button on this season, but are going, to call, uh, are going to encourage us to be secure in my season knowing that God is with me. And so I had amazing friends. This, this, these journals are filled. My kids are going to laugh one day reading these journals like, Mama, you were crazy. Yes, I was, but I stayed the right way. <laughs> I did it in Jesus' name. See, we want a one-of-a-kind type of love, but we don't want to be one-of-a-kind. We want that one-of-a-kind love that, that we see on Instagram, and we talked about the truth behind the picture. It's usually just a picture. There's a lot of problems behind that picture. But we imagine that we want to be this, one, this type of love, but in culture today we have a problem. That is what, that one type of love that you want. You're not willing to be the one type of person that stands out. Does that make sense? See, when we, we want someone to be the minority, but we're not willing to leave the majority. We're not, we're looking like everybody else. We're not standing out. We're wondering, why isn't anybody seeing me? Because you look like everybody else. So if we're on social media or Instagram or TikTok or whatever, if we're on Instagram and I see nothing but the boomerangs of your drink at the bar, guess what? You're the majority, not the minority. And as a woman of God, I'm not looking for the majority. I'm looking for the minority. We have got to make a decision in our lives. Am I going to be a part of the crowd? Am I going to blend in or am I going to stand out? Because God has called me to be separate and to stand out. So if I am looking for the love of my life, right, am I also standing out so that the love of my life can find me? Or am I part of the majority instead of the minority? i got to be the minority. And that's something that you've got to settle now so that it doesn't frustrate you later. See, we live in a society where everything goes. Everything goes. Think back about Joseph. Joseph was a man of God. Can I tell you there's nothing more attractive than a man that worships? There's nothing more attractive than a woman who pours her heart out to God. Those people aren't just good looking, but come on, they're good looking. Like there's something about them, like I don't know what it is. Dude, it's his worship. It's her worship. Like it's their relationship. It makes that person so much more attractive. See, Joseph was the minority in a majority in Egypt. Joseph was a slave purchased into Potiphar's home. And he did rise to success, and Potiphar's wife caught, just caught his attention, right? Or she, he caught her attention. And so Potiphar's wife is attracted to Joseph. And hear me, it's not just because he's a strapping young man. It's because something, there's something different about him. He's standing out. He's a minority, not the majority. And she pursues him. And she's like, lay with me, Joseph. On multiple occasions, she asks to sleep with him. And in one moment, she grabs him, and he flees, and he runs. And he says, I will not dishonor God, and I will not dishonor your husband. I will not dishonor you. See, friends, just because we are given the opportunity doesn't mean that the opportunity is to be taken. We've got to make the choice. Am I going to choose right, or am I going to choose easy? Joseph had every opportunity to do what is easy. But here's the problem. Joseph was a man of God. And he said, I'm not going to be a part of the crowd. I'm not going to do what everybody else is doing. I'm going to be the minority. I'm going to stand out. And I'm going to stand up. And so Joseph chose what was right. See, it's easy. It's so easy to sexually engage nowadays. You don't have to be married. You don't have to be dating. You've got to swipe. Like, it's that easy to be able to do something like that. But it's right to wait. It's right to run from situations that don't honor God, that aren't a part of the picture for your life. Guys, we've got to ask ourselves, don't get stuck in situations that don't tie into your purpose. We can't get stuck in situations that have, no, that have nothing to do with our purpose. We've got to be able to run. 
See, if we look at Joseph, he ended up being everything that God called him to be. He was this ruler in Egypt. He was second in command over a great nation. His family did bow down to him. His relationships were restored. But it's because he was secure in his season. Say season. Be secure in your season. But then we also have David. And hear me, David went through some stuff. When we're talking about your seasons being in your rearview mirror, this man went through some rough things. He killed a giant. We know that. Got married. You thought that you had a rough father-in-law. His father-in-law tried to kill him on multiple occasions. And so this man had some, some stuff in his rearview mirror. But we arrive at a place where I'm about to share with you where David's life is going good. It's going really good. His, his bad seasons are behind him. And right now he's feeling pretty secure. But here's the problem. He's not feeling secure in his season. He's feeling secure in himself. And let me share this with you. So in 2 Kings chapter 11, it says this, One evening David got up from his bed, and he walked around the roof on the palace. From the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. Now, now let me just pause real quick. Some of you have heard this story before in the Bible, and you've heard it preached on. Some people will say that David was lazy. It says that there was a time where kings were off at war. But hear me, David was not being lazy. If a king knew that he was going to win, that he had the favor of the victory, it was normal for the king to stay at the palace. If he was secure in his victory, it was normal in that day and age to step back and be at the palace. But what David did do is that he created a season for himself. See, friends, something we have to be aware of is that often seasons come our way and they're unpredictable. But other times there are seasons that we created from choices. And so David is about to create a choice, a season, because of the choice that he stood up onto the rooftop. Now, it's not because it was just a beautiful spring evening and he wanted to stargaze. David knew that all day long, the water in the bathtubs on the rooftops would be getting warmed in the sun. And that it was culturally acceptable, it was the norm for women to come out and bathe in the evening in rooftops. Because the water was warm. So David went outside, and he saw this beautiful woman, and he sent his messenger, go find out about her. Can I tell you to all my married people, even my singles, don't look. If I can tell you, don't be secure in yourself. Because when we're secure in ourselves, we're saying it's a prideful thing. Okay, God wants you to be confident. He wants you to be strong. But he says that you're more than a conqueror because the one who conquered the world lives inside you. So my strength is not dependent upon what Lindsay can do. My strength is dependent upon what God has done already, and now he's living in me. But the problem and the difference between David and between Joseph is that David was right now operating out of an idea of I'm secure in myself. Don't look. Don't look. See, we live in a culture, I've already said it, where everything is available to you and it's available like that. You don't have to go down to a club anymore to see things that aren't appropriate. You can do it on your phone. You can, you can go on the internet. The, there's, there's things that you can do in the privacy of your home that no one would ever know. But we're still looking. Don't look. And my husband, he's been a part of a mentor group for many, many years. I'm talking 15 years. And he has been an accountability for countless men over the years. For, for purity. In marriages, in relationship, in singleness. Amen. Don't look. See, we need to have accountability. You don't have to tell everyone. Hear me. If, if this is an issue in my life, hear me. If it's, an inter, if it's an issue in your life, it's going to become an issue in your relationships. And so if I have this, 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 this problem or this thing that I am drawn to, I'm drawn to look. I've got an appetite for it. You don't have to tell everybody, but you've got to tell somebody. And that someone can create a powerful accountability with you to keep you heading in the right direction. Some of us in this room might need to delete an app today. Some of us might need to call and cancel our cable. Some of us might have to put the computer only in a public place where the whole family can see it or get an accountability partner, accountability software. Because in today's culture, you can be sexually satisfied in moments, but you can be spiritually and relationally devastated for years. That's the truth. What takes just a moment can devastate us for years. So don't look. So what does David do? They come back and they say, this is Bathsheba. 
and he, she is the wife of this man. And what does David do? Send her to me. Can I tell you, don't look, but don't look again. In our world today, sometimes when you're on Facebook, things might pop up. Sometimes when you said, hey, Siri, oh my God, I'm so scared of that. You guys, you have no idea. My kid, eight-year-olds don't speak so well. They don't pronunciate well. And my kid will say, hey, Siri, show me a picture of, and I'm like, ah! <laughs> like he wants to say bear, like a rawr bear. And I'm like, oh my God, what's going to pop up on that phone, right? Or Alexa, play this song, and then something else comes on because the kid didn't say it right. And all of a sudden, I got boom, chicka, boom, boom playing in my kitchen. We live in a day and age where it's everywhere. Hear me, and it pops up. But my encouragement to you is don't look again. David looked, and then he looked again. If we could say anything to the next generation coming up or to ourselves, let's not look again. So he sent them to go get her. And so he knew it wasn't his wife. This was Uriah's wife. And Bathsheba comes up to his palace. And he's the leader of this country. He's the leader of this people. And he sleeps with her. He takes her and she becomes pregnant. Friends, can I tell you this? James chapter 1 says this. He says, remember when you were being tempted, do not say God is tempting me. We always want to blame someone, don't we? Well, if I wasn't so good looking, then it wouldn't be a problem. Or if Bathsheba wasn't so beautiful, David wouldn't have had an issue. See, God is never tempted to do wrong. And he never tempted anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. Can we see the violence? You can't reason with sin. We try to reason it out. We try to think it out and make it. Make, it's like you cannot go to the negotiation table and negotiate with sin. Sin always wins. It ends in death. You can't change the equation. The only person that could ever interrupt the equation of sin equals death is Jesus Christ. And it's by the death on his cross that you and I are covered for that penalty of sin. And he promises you that he will never, ever, you'll never find yourself in a situation that there's not an exit to. We run. We flee. And so you can't reason without, you can't reason with sin. It says that the desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is full grown, it gives birth to death. So don't look. Don't look again. And don't lie. Don't lie. Whenever I think about lying, I think of a big snowball that started off about this big. But what happens when a snowball rolls down a hill? It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And now you got an avalanche of lies. So what does David do? David's like, oh man, the girl got pregnant. Oops. And so he calls Uriah from the battlefield and says, I need you to sleep with your wife. And like, go, go enjoy your wife. Like, enjoy her. Have fun. Because he's trying to make it seem like it's Uriah's baby and not David's baby. That doesn't happen, Uriah's like, I can't. He's a man of integrity. He's like, I can't go and be comforted by my wife when my men are dying in battle. So he refused to go home to his wife. And so David had him killed, guys. And so now we don't only just have adultery, we have murder. Do you know that when we make choices, our choices put us into seasons. And our seasons don't just affect us, they affect other people. They do. They affect other people. There's a ripple effect. Bathsheba's life was turned upside down. Her husband was killed. She lost the baby that she was pregnant with with David's child. Just a hot mess. It's a hot mess. And so I found myself asking God, man, seasons are tough, God. What do we do with this? Seasons were already tough, but walking through a season in our day and age being the minority in this majority in 2020? God, how are we going to do it? I think of my eight-year-old little boy. If I could blindfold that kid, if I could earmuff his ears and cover them all the time, I would. Because we are exposed to so much stuff. But we can't be surprised. The Bible said there will be a season where anything goes, and it's all accepted. Friends, can I tell you we're in that season? where anything goes, and it's all accepted. But you've got to make a decision. Am I going to be secure in my season? Am I going to be a part of the crowd? Am I going to stand up and be the person who got changed by the cross? Am I going to live in the majority and blend in? Or am I going to be the minority and stand out? We all have needs. We all have desires. 
And our God is a good father who wants to meet those needs. He wants to meet those desires. And so I asked God, God, in this dilemma, what do we do? How can there be strong relationships in our cultural context? How can a mom and dad who've stayed married for decades raise their adult children hoping that they too will stay married for decades? How, God, in this year? How could a man and a woman who come from lines and lines of divorce and adultery and breakup, how can they be married till death do us part? Or come on, Jesus comes back. How? And I felt the Lord tell me this, to be secure in my Savior. See, I'm not just secure in my season. I refuse to be secure in only myself. But I'm secure in my Savior. And I felt the Lord lead me to this scripture I want to share with you. Philippians chapter 1. Paul. Can I tell you right now, if you're in this room, you're like, Lindsay, I've done some David stuff. I didn't run like Jojo. <laughs> I said yes like David. Can I tell you, you're okay? That's why we have Jesus. The beautiful thing about God is that he makes all things new. And so if I lived a life like David, yes, there's ripple effects and there's some things that may be different. But it doesn't mean that you can't turn around and make a change. It doesn't mean that you can walk out new steps that honor God. Paul is here writing the New Testament with what we're about to read. He used to be a murderer of Christians. He zealously pursued the people who called on the name of Jesus and had them beaten, bruised, and killed. And yet God chose to use this man, this broken man, to write almost half of the New Testament. This man went down in history not as a murderer, but as a mighty man of God. I, I stand firm in my faith because the writings of Paul. Does that make sense? The very first scripture that was ever given to me that I had engraved on a Bible was that was written by Paul. And Paul said this, that he who began a good work in you is going to carry it out to completion to the day that Jesus Christ comes back. Meaning that we're all a work in progress and God's going to finish that perfect work so you and I can be complete in him. But here's the scripture God gave me five minutes later. Sorry, I'm a preacher. It happens. It says, I pray that you, your love will overflow. Isn't that great? Paul says, I pray your love will overflow. You thought we were done with overflow. No, overflow is our 2020 word. God wants us to overflow in our relationship with him, but he also wants us to overflow in our relationship with each other. Our friendships to overflow. Our marriages to overflow. Our dating life to overflow in a way that honors God. So he says, I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters. Overflow, love more and more, understand what really matters. Friends, do you, think, do you know that if we just stopped and thought about what really matters, most of our fights would go away. Most of our frustrations would go away. Those poor decisions that we make in our feelings would not be done if we stopped and paused and thought about what really matters. For I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless. How do I stay pure and blameless? How do I walk out my single life in a way that honors God? How do I walk out my marriage in a way that honors God? By understanding what really matters, you walk out and you live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation. What does that mean? Again, friends, it's just a church term. They just said fruit of my salvation. Like, am I supposed to like blossom some grapes? Like what's supposed to happen? If you asked a child in Avenue Kids, if they were here this summer, they would be able to sing you a song of what the fruit of the Spirit is. Meaning that from your relationship with Jesus, your life should show these things. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That those are supposed to be evidence in my life that I am in a progressive, we're moving forward. I'm in a process in my relationship with Jesus. And it says the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. That we're supposed to be men and women of integrity. Hear me, we're not perfect. If anyone tells you they're perfect, slap them, they're lying. They're not perfect. And then say sorry because you're 
You're a Christian. <laughs> Sorry for slapping. I repent. <laughs> but they're not perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm a work in progress. But the goal is not just for the distant future. The goal is for right now. And my right now is I can cling to what really matters. And what matters to you, Emily, is different than what maybe what matters to me. What matters to Jeremy could be different than what matters to Brittany. But you know what? Jesus didn't ask you what really matters to you. He said what really matters to me. If you understand not what really matters to your neighbor or what really matters to yourself, but if you really understand what matters to me, then you're going to see these things happen in your life. And Jesus subbed it up in just two things. He said, do you know what really matters? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself. Because if I love my neighbor as myself, I'm not a taker, I'm a life giver. If I love the Lord with all my heart, I'm not going to look at that man or look at that woman as something that they could do for me. I'm going to look at them and say, you are a masterpiece. You may not know it yet. You aren't living like it. You're not showing that you're a masterpiece. But I know the God that created you. And he created you on purpose, for a purpose. He placed good works in you. And life has been rough on you. And you've been in some seasons. And some of you have been in seasons that you never made it happen. It happened to you. But I can tell you, God can still use all things for good for those who are called according to his purpose. That your season can be your story. And your story can lead you to freedom. It can leave others to freedom. That's how good our God is, is that nothing is left forsaken. So love the Lord. You know what that means? It means God wants you to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, so you can make an eternal difference. Would you stand with me today? Come on, he's so good. He's so good. See, we cannot do this on our own. I'm never going to stand here and tell you that it's easy to be the minority and not the majority. Friends, it's hard. Sometimes it's lonely. Sometimes you're the only one at the table who believes the things that you believe. But I'd rather live in the minority than be a part of a crowd that isn't living to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. I want to live in such a way that the crowd comes over to where I am and wants to be a part of my minority. Come on. Life-giving. But we are never supposed to do it on our own. Jesus, when he told his disciples, I got to leave you guys. It's like, why are you leaving? <laughs> It's like, I got to go because when I go, I'm going to send you a helper. And that helper is going to help you live this life to make it through. How awesome would it be if we all made it through? Wouldn't it be awesome that we didn't get to the end and do something stupid and lose it all? What if our marriages stayed strong? What if the legacies of our children were different? It doesn't mean we're not going to mess up. Friends, we're going to mess up. There's, there's things in this room probably that we have to say sorry to. You know, we got to apologize. we got to got to own up to some stuff. But God is good and he's with us. So would you close your eyes, bow your heads. If you are in this room today and you're saying, Lindsay, I'm in a season, but I've been in a season by myself. I've never asked Jesus to be Lord of my life. I've never even invited him in. But today is the day that I want to ask him to come into my life, not just in this season, but every other season to come. If that is you, would you quick raise your hand for me so I can see who I'm praying with. I want to pray with you today. You just put it right up, put it right back down. Now, I want Jesus to come into my life. It's awesome. It's awesome. We do this as a family. Well, we pray it together. It's not some remedy. It's, it's literally just us speaking our hearts to God. And so if you guys would say this with me, please say, Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for paying for what I did. I receive your forgiveness. Be Lord of my life. Come into my season. Be number one with all my heart, the best way I know how. I'm going to live for you. I now know who I am. I am saved. Come on, I'm redeemed. I'm a child of God. Thank you for watching the Avenue Church YouTube channel, but don't stop here. We would love for you to join our online extended family and subscribe so you don't miss a single video. And don't forget to share this with a friend. You can find out more information about us at avenuechurch.cc and you can watch us live online on our Facebook page every Sunday. You can also support the ministry by visiting avenuechurch.cc give to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. 
Thank you again for watching and God bless you.